Hello and welcome to the Kislev full roster reveal and breakdown. Now the full roster has finally been revealed, which tells us every single unit that Kislev will be launching with when Warhammer 3 eventually drops this year, thereby making my initial roster explanation completely out of date. Big rest in pepperoni for that. Now we're also finding out a little bit more about our faction leaders, as well as the factions they will be leading. Anyway, there's a whole blog post with a ton of information, but who has time for reading? That's nerd shit. So I went through and read it all for you, since I am in fact a mega mind nerd, and I'm here to tell you all about every single unit in the roster, and how I believe they're going to be used. Let's not waste any more time, because we have a lot to go through here, and let's jump straight into this. First of all, we of course have our two legendary lords, starting of course with Tsarina Katarin Bokar. Now, according to a backstory, apparently it is confirming that, at least to the knowledge of Katarin, her fire of Boris, the legendary Kislev ruler, has fallen fighting chaos. So we may not see him in game three, as many were speculating. Of course, this could just be a red herring, and we'll see him eventually later, much to the surprise of Katarin, but we'll have to wait and see. Now, she seems to be a bit of a dictator, even going so far as to have her rivals, quote, removed if they don't agree with her. She's of course the most powerful Ice Witch the world has seen for decades, and does not hesitate to use that magic in battle, as we saw in the gameplay reveals. She's also quick as a train over Frost Maidens and Ice Guard units, which will likely mean an increased capacity, increased recruit rank, and reduced recruitment cost and time of these units. She also has less chance of miscasting, since she is such a great and powerful witch. Finally, she crushes rebellions and corruption wherever she goes, which likely means she has an aura of public order and untainted corruption in whatever form they take in Game 3. As for amounts, she has the choice of a war horse or the war bear, as well as her ice cube that she gets by default. Finally, she can also acquire Frostfang, which is a legendary blade that gives her a powerful ability to use in combat. Our other faction leader is, of course, Supreme Patriarch Kostaltin. He's the leader of the Cult of Urson and of the Grand Orthodoxy. He's a bit of a religious nut, as you might expect, and constantly spouts rhetoric of the enemy while simultaneously urging his own warriors to fight harder through a mix of threats and encouragement. He's a fearless warrior, despite his frail frame, so may well be unbreakable in battle. He's also able to recover from any wound quickly, so may also come with regeneration of some sort, either passive or active. He may also be able to inspire unbreakable and nearby units to keep them fighting when they would normally turn tail. His control of the faith will grant his followers momentum and buffs to take into battle. He also despises Katarin, so may be seeing a fight for the Kislev throne alongside the defense against Chaos. He also has the choice of the War Horse or the War Bear Mount, and has the Urson's Ward ability that allows him to survive even the most mortal wounds and come back more furious than ever. And he also has the Man of the People ability, which means he is never short on Morris to send into battle. This may come in the form of reduced recruitment time and cost for certain units. Now we've got to our generic lords, we should start getting through these a little bit faster now. First up we have the Boyar. These are powerful nobles, often put in charge of specific areas of Kislev, kind of like the Elect Counts of the Empire. They often oversee hundreds of stanitsas, as well as large towns and even small cities. Larger cities are normally overseen by a boyar of particularly high rank, and this is often inherited, but can also be given by the royalty of the faction. In battle, they are tough and brave battlers that don't shy away from any fights. They lead from the front and can take on all foes, whilst providing inspiration for their units. And they of course have the same choice of mounts, of the war horse or the war bear. The other generic lore type is the ice witches. Their ice magic is still extremely powerful, if not quite on the same level of Katarin. This magic is also at its most powerful in Kislev lands, since it is already so damn cold, so the further you stray, these guys may become less and less effective. You can also use the other brand new lore of magic, the lore of Tempest, which can speed along allies and grant enemies a swift death. We don't really get any details about the spells, but from the names and guesswork, I would say we're looking at a few buffs and debuffs, as well as some AoE damaging spells, and possibly a summon. Finally, they have the same choice of mounts as everyone else, the War Horse and the War Bear. Now we come to the heroes, first up, the Ice Maidens. These are basically a scaled down version of the Ice Witches. Interestingly, they are also skilled in diplomacy and intrigue, so this could be some new hero system, perhaps like the one we saw in 3k, rest in peace. And yes, they have the same choice of mounts. Our other hero type is the Patriarch that we saw in the gameplay reveal. They are your frontline fighters that provide buffs to nearby units in a variety of ways. They have passive and active ways to assist their allies, be it in the form of a straight stat buff or even regeneration in an area around them. They also have the same choice of mounts that everyone does. Okay, now we get to the actual units starting, interestingly, with the ranged infantry. First up, we have the Kossars. They are the main units we'll be using in the early Kislev game, since they are basically hunters conscripted into battle. They fight with bows and axes. They're actually quite high quality, despite their amateur appearance. They, however, do not wear much armor, so are for sure not the toughest units in the roster. As we saw in the gameplay, they also come in another variety, spear and bow. That grants them some anti-large and melee defense at the cost of some attack. Next up are Strelsi. 
These lads use great axes that also work as rifles to give them impressive damage in ranged and in melee. They are also armoured so can take quite a bit of punishment without feeling the burn too badly. They are a brilliant hybrid weapons unit that are suited to nearly any situation. Speaking of which, Ice Guard, another hybrid weapons unit. Ice Guards are an all-female unit of elite warriors utilising weapons imbued with ice magic. They are another dual weapons unit that use bows and a choice of dual swords or glaives depending on the situation. They are a great choice for a full front line since they have some anti-large and anti-infantry variants and do brilliant range damage right up until they get into melee combat. Now we move on to the melee infantry, starting with the armoured Corsars. They are heavily armoured and supremely confident battlers to the point of arrogance. Though to be fair, they are the pinnacle of human warriors, so that arrogance is kind of earned. They use pistols and a choice of axes for general combat, or great maces for armour crushing damage. These pistols however do have limited ammo, so think of them more as miners with blasting charges rather than actual gunner units. The Tsar Guard are another unit we saw in the gameplay reveal, and they are the most elite of the elite warriors in Kislev. They were formerly used as guards to the Tsar of Kislev, but they are now at the core of any army since they are so experienced and reliable. They also have two variants, the sword and shield for line holding, and great swords for armour piercing infantry shredding. They are slightly slower than Kossars, but make up for it in damage and insane toughness against the most deadly of foes. Now for the cavalry. First up we have the Kosovite Dervishes. They are your Billy Basic shock cavalry without much armour or weapon strength, but brilliant speed and vanguard deployment, making them into brilliant sneaky charges. They also don't want to get left in combat since the lack of armour or weapons will make them melt rather quickly. The Winged Lancers are next, and they are actually trained cavalry units of extremely fast steeds and high quality war gear for better toughness and better damage. They have a powerful charge that can shatter even the most dedicated of enemy units, and they are slightly slower than dervishes, but nevertheless make up for this with a much greater charge bonus and fantastic damage. But again, you don't want to keep them in battle, otherwise they will start to melt. The Griffin Legion are basically winged lancers that have got further into the skill tree and had more time to grind for better gear. They offer the most powerful charge in the roster, the most armour, the most damage from a horse, whilst also being the slowest. They're a great shot cavalry, so still do need micro to use because you do not want to leave them in. And our final cav unit is the War Bear Riders. Do I really need to tell you anything about these guys? They're elite warriors riding powerful bears clad in heavy armour and heavy weaponry. These are the cav you throw in and leave them since they can take on pretty much anything with barely any effort. When they are done fighting on the battlefield, it will be bear of any enemies. Can I fit any more bear puns in? Well, I can barely think of any more. Now, missile cavalry. Horse archers are first up. Brilliant speed, but basically no armour or melee prowess, so keep them from battling if at all possible. They have decent damage from ranged and can fire on the move, so are great for getting around the backs of enemies and firing into their backs. Think of them as your very standard horse arch units, because that's exactly what they are. The war sleds are next, they are kind of Kislev's answer to the war wagons, and I'm not sure that war wagons pose that much of a threat that they needed an answer. Anyway, I digress. They are kind of like chariot units, but instead of horses, it's bears, and instead of a chariot, it's a sled full of dudes with guns. They are still capable of charging through the enemy for devastating damage, all the while the lads in the back are constantly firing at enemies near and far. There are two variations, light, which are faster and less armoured, and heavy, which are more heavily armoured and deadlier in melee. Now for the monsters, starting with the Snow Leopard. Guessing they will be single entity judging by the trailers we've seen, they are powerful saber tooth leopards that can take on basically anything as long as they are in large enough numbers. They are also super speedy, so basically like a single entity and much larger warhound. Of course we also have the Elemental Bear, which is a massive behemoth made of ice, earth and magic. They can tear up anything you send them at, like infantry, other monsters, or even settlement gates. And they also have the Breath Attack that can tear through basically anything. And finally, the only artillery unit, the Little Grom. This is one of the few military machines allowed in Kislev, since most others are forbidden. They are powerful cannons with a long range and pack a big enough boom to drown out the Hordes of Chaos. They are pulled around by two bears that make it into a monster in melee as well as range, and can even function as a chariot of sorts if needs be. And that's it, that is every single unit that Kislev will be launching with when Warhammer 3 drops, whenever that may be. Thank you so much for watching this video, please let me know in the comments down below which unit you are the most excited for. If you ask me, out of the units I haven't played with yet, I'm quite excited to see how the war sleds work. I'm really hoping they're not as disappointing as war wagons, and they actually have something to offer. If you enjoyed this video at any point, then please do consider leaving it a like, it really does help out a lot. And if you want to see more videos like this, then be sure to hit that subscribe button, it is absolutely free, and it really does help me out. I'd like to say it's time to thank all supporters of the channel, in particular of course, Kobe said so, Nifty Norm, I thank you every time, but I really can't thank you enough for supporting me on that unclean ones tier. Thank you to every single one of you for watching, and for now, I've been Colonel Damders, and I will see you next turn.